So, thank you once more for being here. We shall continue after the outstanding presentation by, with the keynote speaker, Stephanie Endlich. And in this panel discussion has three speakers, even though they are just one because they have prepared these into um, three into one presentation with the three researchers we have with us, Kamil Kaszewski from Poland, Ricardo Bulgarelli from Italy, and then Moises Fernandez Cano from Madrid, Spain. They are all researchers at the European University Institute, one of the most prestigious research centers in Europe in Firenze, in Italy, and they will tell us how the LGBTQ community in these three countries have fought for their rights throughout the 20th century, but they will also focus on the way we remember these struggles and the way that these communities and their achievements are remembered. We will also talk about the terms, the terminology that we've been using when preparing, when designing the agenda for this conference. And this was a long-standing discussion uh, with the researchers, but also with the Catalan government supporting this meeting. And, yeah. and we will tell you why we have chosen for the LGBTQ plus or LGBTI plus, whether you we are incorporating the Q or the I. This is something that we will talk about later on, maybe opening up the floor for discussion. And, and I hope that the three researchers here also tell us about the title on this panel discussion, Shantai Yustai. And this is a title taken from one of the icon uh, one of the iconic stages statements by the queer figure that's from RuPaul's and so the three researchers that we have here with us have chosen this topic as a as a nod to the queer world so I'll hand it over to Camille now Hello. Uh, I will stand if it will not disturb you. It's much easier for me to focus and also to observe the presentation. Um, so uh, we will talk about remembering and memories in, uh, in uh, three European countries. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the title Chante, You Stay, uh, it refers, as Oriol mentioned before, to one of the most famous TV shows um, where where contestants, uh, drag queens, fight for the title of the best drag queen. Every episode, at the end of the episode, uh, the jury that consists of, let's say, queer celebrities decides who of the contestants should go home and who should stay. And of course, it's a big tension. Um, the person that is lucky to stay hears from the head of the jury Shante, you stay, and it came, kind of became um, a very symbolic, iconic moment. For us, it seemed very interesting because it's a moment that can be a metaphor of a situation where queer community itself decides who we can memorize or who we pay attention to and who we kind of drop in our narratives. So it's not a decision of the mainstream or the majority but of the community of itself, and I think this topic will um, appear several times. Um, I wanted to ask you in the beginning, um, do you know, starting my presentation about Poland or queer history in Poland, do you know when Poland decriminalized homosexual acts? Uh, in what year? Or do you have a guess? What would, you, what would be your intuition? Um, in 1932, uh, Poland was the second country in 20th century after the un um, Soviet Union that decriminalized homosexual acts, uh, was quite a pioneer. Um, this, is, <laughs> this man is the head of the commission, 
that decided to decriminalize. Actually, the decision was taken already in the early 20s, but there were other more controversial issues for them to discuss. So it took around 10 years before the uh, criminal code that you can see on the left entered into force. Uh, we decided to start with kind of very short um, overview of European uh, history of queer from a perspective that I think we are not so familiar with. Usually we are presented with a map of Europe that tells a narrative of marriage equality or civil partnerships. And this narrative is very familiar and I think very often presents not such a um, challenging story where we have several pioneers among them, Spain also I think, but also uh, Denmark, Holland, uh, the countries that started, and then of course the ugly sister called Eastern Europe. Um, however, when we think about the criminalization of homosexual acts in Europe, I think this narrative presents us with something much more challenging and especially challenging our imagination of, of different parts of the, of the continent. When we look in the beginning of the 20th century, and of course the political map, as we know, was completely different, um, we had actually two systems. The one uh, consisting of so-called, like, let's say, Southern Europe, that was based on Napoleonic codes that traditionally didn't um, criminalize homosexual acts as such. Uh, although sometimes people, especially men, were persecuted based on other uh, reasons, vagabondism or um, uh, indecent behavior, let's say. However, they were not targeted as, as, as a group. And then the other uh, part of Europe that was targeting actually this group, what was mentioned before by, by Stephanie, uh, the paragraph 175 in Germany, um, uh, paragraph 129 in Austria, for example. And they were, then were also this, actually two examples in Europe, Austria and Sweden, that criminalized homosexual acts between women, which was quite unique, and this is still a controversy why and what was the reason. Um, then what happens, um, around after the First World War, what I call the first wave of the criminalization. And here is the, actually, this is the proper map, um, Soviet Union or Soviet Russia starts this trend in 1917. Then in 1932, Poland decriminalized homosexual acts. The next year, with actually the same legal provisions, Denmark, in 1942, Switzerland, in 1944, Sweden, Around the, in the, in the 30s, still Estonia as well, that is often forgotten, and Iceland. And it happens actually, this, this process kind of ends by the end of, of the Second World War. Um, paradoxically, it starts in German speaking area, where the activism was unsuccessful. It came very close to the criminalization in Germany, in Weimar Republic. Um, at the end of the 1920s, beginning of 30s, and of course the Hitler came to power, and all the idea um, um, collapsed. However, it very much influenced other countries. Such activists like Magnus Hirschfeld traveled several times, for example, to Estonia to lobby for the change of the law. They had also influence on the change of the law, especially in Denmark, but also in Poland. Um, what happens next is that just a year after Poland decriminalized homosexuality with the tightening grip of power uh, in Soviet Union, the Soviet Union recriminalizes homosexuality. Um, then of course with the territorial expansion, the law is expanded to, to Estonia. In the, after, after the Second World War, also Spain and Portugal actually end this kind of more liberal tradition and as far as I know in 1954 uh, Francoist uh, Spain criminalizes homosexuality as well. <clears throat> and then we have something that I call the second wave of, of the criminalization and it happens in between mostly mid 60s and, 
and the 80s. 83, Portugal is the country that decriminalizes homosexual acts again, 79, Spain. Uh, there is this wave, especially in the 60s and, 80s and 70s, only partially related to so-called sexual revolution in countries like um, Uni United Kingdom and Germany. However, the countries on the other side of the Iron Curtain, especially Czechoslovakia and the time Hungary and Bulgaria, are a bit earlier. So, for example, Eastern Germany decriminalized homosexual acts a year before Western Germany. Um, interestingly, uh, yes, among the, those that were lagging behind were Austria in 1971, 72 before I mentioned Nor Norway. Uh, this all ha is happening around 30 years after the, the criminalization of homosexuality in Poland. And then in the 1990s, with the collapse of, 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 of um, Cold War system, and we have this, what I call the third wave of the criminalization, with all the new countries, but also Ireland, I, as far as I remember, 1994, or Liechtenstein, which is a small addition. Um, so, actually, w when we look at this map, we can see that it is a kind of a different narrative that we usually have when we talk about marriage equality, that is kind of across this iron cart, across the iron curtain, and across a lot of concepts that we have about Europe. Um, so coming, focusing a bit on Poland, and I know that it seem, may seem a far away topic and um, sh maybe some, some of you have never um, heard anything about history of queer in Poland. So just to shortly um, mark or signal uh, the, the timeline. The, the term homosexuality in Poland emerges in 1893 and is quite uh, smoothly just translated from German by a Polish student of Kraft Ebbing, uh, famous um, s founder of sexology, commonly perceived today as a founder of sexology. So his student is just introducing the term in Polish. But already in 1917, 19, 1915, 1917, we have first um, novels, short stories that actually show, written by queer people and presenting queer desire in an affirmative way. Then we have interwar period when Poland gains independence between 1918 and 1939. And for example, in 1923, there is quite a scandal in Warsaw related to a lesbian doctor, one of first um, Physi physicians in physici physicians in um, in Poland, and she during the trial she um, openly claims that being a lesbian is not um, offensive; it's not denigrating for a woman. Uh, and in 1932, as I mentioned, there is the the criminalization. Then we have the period, of course, of the Second World War, a pink triangles, a big different topic on its own. And what happens after the Second World War is, of course, the uh, time of communism. What in official narratives, especially in Polish historiography, is never mentioned, but what is very typical, as I think, believe, I believe with my queer eye, I look at Polish history, there were certain very similarities, features that really um, made, made conservative, Catholic, right-wing, um, side of, of political spectrum uh, very similar to, to the communist regime. And one of them was basically being very prurient. Uh, so talking or showing publicly any kind of uh, non-normative behaviors was not accepted. We have to remember that in 1920s in Warsaw, they were, uh, they were men in drag we have a movie, quite a famous movie from 1930s, with uh, basically with a drag queen. Uh, we had transgender sex workers in the streets. They all disappear in the mid-30s, and they actually don't reappear until the end of the communist time. And in the 1983, uh, there is a f there is an attempt to start a, m a movement again in Poland. 
uh, there is an activist, um, actually an immigrant in Austria, in Vienna, who publish, who writes, prepares a magazine in his home in Vienna, copies it and distributes illegally in Poland. And this is the, the beginning of the, of, of kind of this new wave of uh, uh, queer movement. In, 19, in mid 1980s, we have an action uh, operation of the police that was made to a movie recently by uh, of Netf on Netflix called Hyacinth, when um, police on state scale tries to register all homosexuals. But then it's the end of the communism. It was probably also related to the starting HIV crisis, but it's, it hasn't been basically researched what happened during the operation. And I put as a symbolic date this date 1920, uh, 2020, last presidential election in Poland, when it was for first, I think for the first time, so explicitly and openly deployed homophobia as a political tool to win elections. But it also galvanized the queer community or LGBT community in Poland. So to make it short, we don't have much time. I wanted to, when thinking about commemorating and about memory, what Stephanie was talking about before, mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking there are three kind of ways the queer community in Poland refers to the past. Uh, one is commemorating victims of persecution. That's what we very much talked about in, con in the context of monuments, right? Uh, especially the pink triangles, the Second World War, then the other stream is very often by the queer community treated as something opposite of not showing martyr martyrology and not showing suffering, but rather showing an affirmative narrative that would focus on recovering forgotten stories or basically outing very famous um, personalities in Poland from the past. That's why I put it, this pride pack there. And then third way is this, of course, fighting for rights and citizenship and belonging, trying sometimes to being, to gain um, legitimacy and respectability through, for example, performing attachment to the nation, to the state, and to the values um, of the majority. And the right-wing answer, and since the last, Actually, yes, since, since the fall of the communists, we can say the answer from the majority and from the government to this kind of strategies is either ignoring or silencing, very often presenting whenever this, the queer subjects try to say we are part of the nation or the country, actually the answer from the other, no, it's a foreign. A very typical motive is saying that it's something that comes from the West, it's a Western um, invention. I think this was partially your question before, um, something that is imposed on Poland. Mm. So I very shortly show, we, as, as uh, Stefanie Endlich mentioned before, apart from this uh, tormented story of the rainbow in Warsaw, which has its continuation now, the debate is going on to rebuild it again in a different form, and it's kind of a grassroots movement, there are no monuments in the public, and they are not really dis dis disputed. I don't know, I, I know so some activists in Poland, obviously, and this never appears as a topic. I think also the assumption is that it's too, too difficult and not the most important thing now when there are no um, rights or, for example, legal protection. But one of the ways of commemorating is this uh, mostly grassroots still movement of, uh, of memorizing, commemorating the history. And in this case, it's the hist for example, this is the book that was published last year. Uh, they, Homosexuals During the Second World War, the title is They. It has been actually a few days ago nominated to the most prestigious literary uh, prize in Poland, which was kind of a surprise. Um, however, this is, <clears throat> there are other examples of kind of entering the public opinion, public memory. Another way, is, as I mentioned before, is reco recovering forgotten silence or que uh, stories, queer lives. The picture that you have here is uh, Jarosław Iwaszkiewicz. Uh, he was 
one of the most important writers in Poland of the second of the 20th century. Some claim that actually allegedly the most important the most important the most prolific writer. He had a wife. We know now from the letters that she was also sometimes into women. They had children, they were a loving couple. He had also relations with men with many men during his life. And actually the adjective queer very I think very well describes uh, life of Jarosław Iwaszkiewicz. So several years ago, some publications started basically writing about it openly. Uh, part of this was pictures that were found of Jan Iwaszkiewicz uh, made, uh, taken by his friends, uh, showing actually quite a vivid life of uh, homosexual or community, let's say, in the 1920s and 30s in Poland. And this is this other uh, kind of focus in memorizing, not on the suffering, but on that kind of po affirmative way of showing actually many famous people in Polish history were actually queer. These are other examples. Um, it's a very popular book, Homo Biographia, ho uh, Homo Biographies. These are very short biographies collected of like really most important Polish public figures in the 20th century. Um, Olga Tokarczuk, the Nobel Prize winner, I think two, three years ago, commented here on the top, I think Jarosław Iwaszkiewicz now finally in the Kevin can say, finally. So um, the book, when, when the po book was published. Uh, but this is again an idea of showing they we've been part of the nation or the part of, of Polish culture. Here is another book um, by a friend actually about the doctor, the, f the, the female doctor that was um, accused of being lesbian, as I said before. Um, it's her first, uh, the, her first kind of biography or the writing about the trial. And the third thing that I said is this kind of trying to being um, included in the nation, I think. This is a picture taken a year ago during a Pride in Krakow. What I noticed and was very striking for me, it was not the only flag of this kind, there were several flags, which integrated Polish flag with, uh, with the rainbow flag. Uh, by kind of, uh, as a way of saying, we are part of this country, we belong to the country. And of course, by many people it was, uh, conservative, by many conservatives, it was perceived as an attack or actually desecrating of Polish flag. However, a lot of LGBT people in Poland are also very attached to nationalism, we have to remember. And at the end I wanted to show two case studies to show how this playing with memory or using memory as a political tool and, and the fight for queer rights is used. One is this most famous. So what happened uh, most famous one when the clashes happened, the fights in the streets, riots in, the, in, the, in 2020 in Warsaw. There was a kind of a long preludium to these events. Mm, in two, between 2019 and 2020, a peculiar idea was born in some, I don't know even where, in some conservative circles, to proclaim singular small communities and municipalities in country as LGBT free zones. Soon around 100, almost 100 commu communities declared themselves LGBT free zones. As you can see on the map, some of them, especially I think the green ones, are those that actually either withdrew later or they kind of resigned from the idea. So it was also not so obvious Sometimes they were debated and there were no enough votes in the, in the communities. But many of them, the red ones, actually, the, the, the initiatives were successful. Um, so the sentiment was kind of uh, declared and it was used by the current president of Poland during his last campaign, presidential campaign, when he was basically very unsure of winning. He was kind of losing in the polls. And he deployed then the LGBT homophobic, anti-LGBT homophobic speech, uh, thinking that he was smart, but it was of course something that haven't, hasn't been used in Europe on that scale, I think, since Second World War. And I think 
most of people, or we try to believe that we are aware that you don't use these things for political purposes. But he did, and he succeeded. He won. He won the election uh, with a lot of... He, famously, he said, for example, LGBT, is an, LGBT people are not people. They are, they are ideolo an ideology. And it was... Um, and it um, galvanized these protests and started the protests that happened. Um, the, the picture that I had earlier of the woman with the flag, this is from the protests. And uh, part of this protest was like several days of kind of riots and protesting in the streets, blocking uh, several places. But what happened in, I think, August 2020, um, there was a turn in Polish uh, movement, activism in Poland, um, which always has been actually pacific. Uh, as most of Europe, as Austria, for example, there was, there's never been a stone wall, right, in Europe. This is, American, this is an American story. But what happened is that this group of young activists, they said they don't, they don't believe anymore in this peaceful thing. This doesn't work. This, this didn't bring anything in Poland. And they started kind of more provocative um, um, actions. And one of them was taking rainbow flags and putting them in Warsaw in the most important, attaching them to the most important symbolic monuments. So it was kind of a changing a bit the monument, makeshift, makeshift sculpture, let's say. And one of them was putting them on Jesus with the cross, which is highly, a highly symbolic place in Warsaw. It is in front of the church where there is a uh, heart of Frédéric Chopin, which was smuggled by his sister after his death in the 19th century, so the very important for the culture of the country. But also it was destroyed by the Nazis during the Warsaw Uprising, the church. And this picture is actually super famous. I think all, every child sees it in the school. Of like fallen uh, sculpture of Jesus destroyed by Nazis, so desecrated in front of the, of the destroyed church after the Warsaw Uprising 1944. So what the activists did, they claimed the statue and attached the flag and to add several other documents, uh, monuments in Warsaw. And there was a response from the, from the government. So I think the next day even, or the second, uh, the prime minister said it was the secretion of, of the sculpture. Uh, he published picture of himself praying in front of the, I think kneeling in front of, the, of Jesus. And he put, he left the, like the candle. You can see that that's prime minister on the right uh, from the sculpture. He left a candle uh, with like official candle of the, of the government. And the, the, here are the activists that I mentioned. They're fairly young people um, and a transgender leader, actually non-binary person, very challenging for, 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 the, for the society and for the, for the conservative. What they did as a response, they stole the candle and they carried it to the bridge in the middle of Warsaw when a year ago transgender person committed suicide. And posted it everywhere, which of course the media then took over and reposted uh, almost everywhere. And they wrote, you idiot, you should put the candle here. And this is the person, this is Milo, uh, this transgender person that committed suicide jumping from the bridge into the Vistula River in 1919. I think it was winter, so also the water was ice cold. You know, it's Poland. Uh, everything is quite harsh, also the winter. Um, and unfortunately, of course, the, the, the person died, but left a letter when she explained her frustration with, with, with the system, but actually with, with psychologists, doctors, therapists, who could try to fix her. Um, and that's the, 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 that's the candle. It's written, you know, there is a flag, there is a coat of arms. It's written the prime minister. So they took this candle and symbolically put it in the place where they believed, and I, I believe that it should be. And that's another way of, a uh, very similar way of um, intervening into the public space. Here is Maria Konopnicka, another famous writer. Don't be surprised, it's, it's not only an impression, like a lot of Polish public figures and a lot of 
Polish literature was written by queer people, some people claim to much further extent than any literature in Europe. So uh, Maria Konopnicka um, is a very famous nationalist writer, like very important for this patriotic early 20th century discourse of Polish nationalism. But she also had a partner. They lived like, like in a marriage. We, we have correspondence between them as a loving couple. Of course, that was not even a time where uh, terms like homosexual were used. So we don't know if how they perceived themselves. However, we know they lived together they, um, until their death, and um, yeah, there was a couple. So what some activists do, and it's not only with Maria Konopnicka, they put, for example, flags, or here, um, coloring the, um, some, putting somewhere rainbow symbols around these monuments. And there is always a response from above. So for example, this is very early, actually this is 2022, a Polish parliament um, um, proclaimed Maria, the, the, the year 2022 the year of Maria Konopnicka. Of course, not mentioning at all uh, any connection to queer or a rainbow symbols of, or LGBT rights, uh, but rather, ex of course, using Polish flag and quite kind of trying to bring her back to the nationalist uh, heterosexual um, narrative. And that's it. I, I think I'm afraid I went a bit over time. Um, I hope um, we can, of course, discuss if you have any questions. I'm sorry if it was a bit scattered. I had to make I had hard decisions. And especially, I think, when, uh, since Stephanie Endlich was talking about monuments, I was thinking that um, we have also this monuments or ways of memorizing, as you could see here, that are kind of makeshift. They appear, disappear, people write things on the walls, and sometimes they are more, much more uh, challenging and challenged and much more provocative than monuments that have been decided by the community. Because, for example, obviously, like in this case, putting a flag, attaching it to, the, to Jesus was extremely powerful, um, powerful um, act. I can only uh, present in the margin that it doesn't seem it was as provocative as we could thought because the transgender activist, um, Margot, she wrote, I think, her dissertation or even PhD dissertation, I'm not so sure now, uh, maybe master, master dissertation, about uh, Catholicism. And she always claims she's a deeply believing Catholic. Uh, at the same time, um, fighting for LGBT rights. Um, I hope uh, you liked it. Thank you very much. And now uh, I give my voice to... Moises. So, can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. You can hear me in the, in the room? Yeah? Okay. So, um, I will apologize because I'm lazier than Camille, so I will remain seated. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Um, and I will start my presentation with a picture that probably all of you know, or if you don't know, it's from Barcelona. It's really well known, and it's one of the um, big... Uh, memories of uh, the struggles uh, in the Spanish state uh, fighting for the sexual liberation movements. But my presentation won't focus on this history. And actually, I will move quite away from this uh, perspective on sexual liberation movements because my perspective and my approach to queer history is quite different. Uh, I, mm, I say in my title, Unveiling the Ordinary, the Importance of Everyday Stories in Collective Memory, uh, because, and I will get a little personal here. I grew up uh, in a southeastern uh, province in Albacete. Uh, then I moved to Valencia when I was 18 years old to study history. Then I did my master thesis here in Barcelona. And during these six years of uh, history studies, nobody mentioned in any class anything about LGBTQ history. I just remember in my master thesis, uh, one seminar about a democratic transition in Spain, and they mentioned that LGBTQ struggles was just a part of the transition movements, uh, and they don't actually regard to the specific issues that LGBTQ communities were uh, suffering under Franco's regime. But first, I want to start with a little story. So, 
the 21st of December of uh, 1957 in Madrid, in Plaza Mayor, that uh, is one of the main uh, historical uh, landmarks in the city right now, maybe well known because one mayor a few years ago um, recommended people to have a cafe con leche in Plaza Mayor. Maybe you know the city for that. Uh, well, a group of uh, 20 to 25 uh, uh, years old uh, men were having fun. It was 11 p.m. You can imagine the winter in Madrid is quite cold. So uh, the police noticed that they were actually having like this party in the streets of Madrid in a historical landmark. Uh, and it's not like now that it's full of restaurants and bars and it's full of tourists. In that moment, actually, was one of the main points for me, uh, men hustlers and for actually prostitution solicitation. So it was not the historical monument it is today. It was more a place for vagos y maleantes. Um, so this group uh, was detained by the police and one of the, of the young men uh, was arrest, arrested, prosecuted, and uh, get to the uh, Dirección General de Seguridad in Puerto del Sol, the current government of Madrid. It used to be the security center where gay people was arrested. And when they were actually uh, processing this guy, they discovered that he has some pictures. And these pictures are actually those I saw in you. I blur the face because I want to uh, keep the anonymity of this guy, but uh, this story is telling us something that actually we cannot know, and we won't never know, because one of the pictures, the first one, uh, seems this guy with a flower, and uh, if you don't have the blur image, actually he was uh, having makeup. In the other picture, we can see the same guy dancing with another guy, and the third picture shows maybe just two friends in the beach, maybe something else. What I want to do with this. So usually when we think about a uh, history of LGTB communities or queer communities, we think about the history of sexual liberation movements. And this is really important because it's the history of how actually we fight against some decriminalizations and criminalizations in different parts of Europe and the world. And we commemorate these struggles. But sometimes this approach also obviates or forgets about other aspects of our queer memory. Um, for example, uh, one of different approaches is uh, working on queer memories through local histories. Local histories could seem like uh, narrow in the sense that we are focusing on a specific city in a specific uh, place like Madrid, Barcelona, New York. And one of the first uh, examples of this was Gay New York in 1994. Uh, was one of the main books regarding a specific place. Then we have other uh, examples like Queer London in 2005, but we have recently other examples like Queer Budapest. But we have works like this uh, about other cities like Berlin. We have even more works on London with different perspectives, different stories. And for example, about Barcelona, we have the book Los Antisociales of Geoffrey Huard. It's not based just in Barcelona, it compares Paris and Barcelona, but it includes a lot of places. And these uh, books, even if they, of course, uh, tangle with the history of repression, the history of legal frameworks, they also uh, work with the quotidian. Because local history, history from below, not just from the administration and from justice system, from also uh, from a daily basis, so from the quotidian perspective of queer people, whether using oral uh, archives or traditional archives, used from the idea of the quotidian, rebuilds experiences and stories that traditionally remain outside the, historic, the, the historiographic narrative. Uh, if we try to find the history of queer people in history books, we will probably find maybe a mention to the LGBTQ struggles in the 70s, and this is really important, but we hardly find any mention of actually how queer people lived before these struggles. And there is a problem here uh, that we can discuss later, is that sometimes these histori historical approaches are thought from a teleological point of view. What I mean with this? We know what happened already. We know that in the 70s there was a, a historical political movement that fight for our freedom and that we get some rights and we are still fighting for more rights and we are fighting against uh, some ideas that are coming back from the past. But people in 62 or uh, 57, like this guy I, I saw you in the picture, they didn't know that in the, 70, uh, in the 70s they will have a liberation movement and they were still queer people and they were still having queer lives, queer sex, queer intimacies and queer uh, memories that are also important because it's part of our common history and it's part of our community. So 
Therefore, putting the focus on these histories, of these stories, the quotidian histories, makes visible the invisible, the ignored realities, but also helps us to problematize the monolithic discourses on the allegedly invisibility or non-presence of queer people in the public space, in the streets of our cities, and also brings out other issues such as class or migration. Usually, if you take a random history book, they don't mention queer people. It's like suddenly in the 70s, we rise up, we fight for our rights, but before that, it seems that we, we were invisible. We were nowhere in the cities. And it just takes one minute to talk with an elder from our community, and you will discover how many places, how many struggles, how many daily fights they had in their daily lives before this 70s uh, uh, uprisings. And one uh, more methodological uh, and conceptual uh, importance issue for me is that uh, queer lives always occupy a public space. Queer people, we don't have in history actually the right to have a privacy, to have private life, because society and even ourselves scrutinize everything we do. So our bodies, our lives are always public lives. So either at home, either at streets, we are public bodies, and it means that streets, public venues, cities, but also home, belongs to the domesticity of queer people. So when we talk about queer histories, we should have to talk about this queer domesticity in a broad sense that takes both the private and the public, since we didn't have the right to have a private space for ourselves, because even either families, either the state, even the police uh, forces, they were always scrutinizing and looking for what we do, how we do, and how we belong. Where? My research focuses obviously in Spain and I do the local history of Madrid because uh, for me it's easier to understand the sources in Spanish so it's why I work on Madrid and because actually we lack in the Spanish state of local histories. We hardly know anything about even Barcelona that is maybe the, the most known of the cities but uh, recently there are a lot of people working across the Spanish state to recover this memory and I think this is kind of echoing what we were discussing previously in the discussions about what kind of objects, what kind of materiality we can have uh, to recover because of course we know the legal framework, we know la ley de vagos y maleantes and we, and we know la ley de peligrosidad y rehabilitación social. These are the two main laws that actually affected the lives and the daily experiences of queer people. But it doesn't mean that before 1954 there were no prosecution of uh, queer people. Of course they were prosecuted but under so many others like public scandal or just uh, we cannot think that before Franco there was not homophobia. Of course homophobia was something quite real. And I want to take two other cases, two other examples to uh, show you how actually local history can provide a lot of reference to different topics that go beyond the legal framework that even if it's important and, uh, and of course these sources I get from the files that are under the Ley de Vagos y Maleantes in Madrid. So I use the legal sources, but with the point of view of the quotidian and the daily lives. So this fair case actually uh, is really, really complex, but I will bring you uh, some points that I think they're interested. This is file 50, uh, uh, 576 and file 104. It's the same case. One of the files is for one of the people involved, and uh, the other file is for the other people involved. Actually, this is one of the cases of two women uh, uh, that I found. So it's a case of female homosexuality. And I think this um, case, not just because it's one case about le lesbianism condemned under the lay of Vagos Maleantes, that sometimes we think that, uh, as it was mentioned before, that there's like a whole, uh, a whole about history of female sex, female to female sex, uh, we find uh, different aspects. For example, I have a quote from this file. Comenzando a tocarla por todas las partes de su cuerpo. Starting to touch her everywhere and kissing her in the lips, behaving like a man having sex with a woman. This contains pages and pages and pages, and when I say pages is that actually you can uh, wrote a book just about this case, because the doctors and the judges they really were trying to understand how two women were having sex. They really were surprised that women were having sex. They, they could not even imagine, so part of the file is not actually to accuse them, it's to prove how actually they have sex. Because if there is a lack of penis here, and we're talking about this, uh, this female, it's not about transgender uh, female, uh, they thought, okay, 
we cannot accuse them because there is a lack of penis, so there is no sodomy, there is no actually sexual intercourse, but at the end there is a um, psychiatric uh, forensic um, report on one of the women, the older one involved in this situation, that uh, apparently was manly, uh, he was shorter stature, more rude, the way she behaves is more manly. So finally they decided that this woman should be prosecuted because maybe she induced the other woman who was a female, younger uh, woman, and maybe she's the victim, we have one person to blame, but she was only blamed under the basis that he was manly. So to be considered as someone who be prosecuted, there was like gender bias. So this approximation to local history is having uh, a lot of information for us, how actually Francoism regime considered gender uh, and gender binarism, and actually it's challenged the idea of a woman being manly means that it's a woman or not, and they have this, this kind of discussions already in the 60s, but also is talking us about how actually the idea of being the manly part of a lesbian relationship could uh, have other consequences different than to the other. Because if we follow the case, the older woman, the manly woman was actually condemned and she has to pay a, a, a bill and has to go through, through jail, while the other woman that finally said that she was actually um, just uh, mad and uh, she was attracted by the money of the elder, so it was not her fault, it was just a moment of, uh, um, I don't know how to, to say, because she used a specific word, I, uh, un momento de olvido, uh, but uh, apparently this moment of uh, forget, uh, stays for at least two to three years having sex uh, with that woman, so I think uh, maybe it's not a moment of, but of course, she was fighting for her life, she was fighting for her freedom, so we cannot actually condemn this person for uh, trying to get uh, free. But also this story is telling us much more, because one of the things when we talk about in the case of the Spanish state is that we usually focus on Madrid and Barcelona. I myself, I'm doing my PhD on Madrid, but none of these women were from Madrid. The younger woman was actually from Galicia and the older woman was from Malaga. And actually the story of the older woman was quite interesting. She was born uh, in Lanjaron, sorry, it's Granada, the province of Granada, but she moves quite young to, to Malaga and in, Galada, in Malaga she tried to become a nun but she was expelled by uh, the monastery uh, with other two women. There is a letter from the Bishop of, Mal uh, I think from the Bishop of Malaga talking about this situation and they didn't mention why they were expelled from the monastery, but apparently there was some strange behaviors between the three of them. And then they moved to actually to Barcelona. They live here, there are no much records on what they did in Barcelona. And finally they moved back to Madrid. And in Madrid they opened a boarding house, a hostel for uh, young ladies. And this uh, boarding house was in the city center, really close to the actual parliament of Spain, uh, in Carrera de San Jerónimo, and for so many years, it was a place for ladies. What it happens there? We don't know. But maybe a closer look to the local history of Madrid will reveal how a lot of lesbian women coming from different parts of Spain were having connections there or not, because one uh, this case started when, when this lady from Galicia moved to Madrid, started living there, and apparently after a few months living there, the, the older woman from Lanjaron started to have more intimacy with them, and the older lady uh, pays for a really rich room, and they start going to actually to Lanjaron for holidays, and people in Lanjaron start gossiping above them because apparently they were having like sex all the time, sexual parties, orgies. So this is talking about migration and different directions because we usually think about rural spaces going to the big cities, but in this case we have, of course, someone who goes from Lanjaron to Malaga to Barcelona, then to Madrid, but from Madrid they usually go on holidays to Lanjaron, and in Lanjaron, a rural space, they were actually having quite a, a lot of sex, apparently, according to the files. And my last case uh, that also brings a lot of top topics to discuss is a really complex topic. Uh, a student, medicine student from Canary Islands moves to Madrid to get his PhD in medicine and first because he was arrested several times through the 60s. The first time he was arrested because he was having sex uh, with uh, different men but he was arrested in many, in many times in history and actually his file is more or less this, uh, this big so you can also spend like a whole uh, book uh, talking about this guy. Um, but uh, it also lets us talk about the connection between different cities. 
For example, this guy was involved with, a different, with another guy who was from Barcelona. Uh, this guy from Barcelona uh, was rejected by his family, so he decided to move to Madrid, but he was going and back all the time from Madrid and Barcelona. So it talks about actually the connection between two different big cities and how people move looking for some spaces of freedom. Because of course, Barcelona in these years could be a space for freedom, but if your family actually rejects you, uh, it means that uh, you, can, you have to find different ways. And we can track the, the way of this guy that moves not just to Madrid, he goes all around Spain looking for different spaces of freedom. He was arrested different times, and finally sometimes we find find this guy in Madrid where he is arrested and having connections uh, with him. And one thing that surprised me is that this file contains several letters, handwriting letters, of the guy from Canary Islands writing to the, guy, to the family of the guy from Barcelona, asking the parents of this guy from Barcelona to reject another guy. Apparently, the guy who was from Barcelona has different boyfriends, uh, and the guy from Canary Island was apparently one of these boyfriends, and he was jealous of the other. So this guy asked the family in Barcelona, please, could you tell your son that uh, he, he would be better with me? Of course, he doesn't use the word boyfriend, but you can see from the words that they have emotional connection. But this case even become more interesting uh, because in the middle of the 60s, the guy from Canary Islands is again arrested, and uh, is in this case, is involved with another guy in Madrid, and they have a connection, and they are interrogated. They have like a long, long interrogation file, and they talk about who they know in Madrid who is also queer. The police was trying to get information about, about other queer people, and they mention a German guy. And the story of this German guy is actually quite interesting. I have in the beginning of the declaration of the German, for reasons of anonymity, I keep the name out. Uh, but you can read here, Declaración del Detenido, que en el año 1900... Statement of the detainee. In 1954, he left Western Germany because he had been charged with homosexuality twice. He went to Switzerland, he spent more than one year, and he was arrested by the Swiss police. And then he goes through France down to Spain, where he enters illegally in 1956 through the mountains. He went to Madrid to be a founding partner. A way to actually recognize who is this person. But cita en la calle de in Serrano Street. Have a person from Western Germany coming to Spain in the 50s looking for freedom? It's something that when I was reading it, it was really hard to understand. But we have to understand that in that moment, actually, homosexuality was also prosecuted in Western Germany in a really different way and in a really different, but if he remains in Germany, uh, he would be in jail. So why he decided to come to Spain? Not because the situation in Spain was better. No, of course not. It's not, nothing related to that. But there was a sort of kind of privilege that we can find in the files of local histories that are related to class and are related also of a region. You can find how hardly ever working class people from working class neighborhoods in Spain or in the cities of Spain were all already condemned and they went to jail. They have to pay really extremely fees. Or if they were not condemned, they pay just to get freedom. But in the case of many uh, people from Western Europe or even North Americans that live in Madrid or cities such as Barcelona, the regime decided to have a different look on them. Of course, if they were caught in a sexual intercourse with another man or another woman, they were also condemned. But they usually were not condemned in the same way that the people from the Spanish state. This is talking also about how actually Spain in this moment, especially from the 60s, became a popular destiny for sexual intercourse. There are places such as Torremolinos or Sitges that became really important for Northern Europeans coming to the Spanish Francoist regime, looking for the orientalization of uh, South uh, queer bodies and also because they, they found somehow a spaces for these uh, sexual intercourses. It doesn't mean that the Francoist regime was a space of liberation, of course not. It's quite the opposite. Uh, using this strategy of allowing people from other countries, all the realities, having a spaces of freedom, actually was reinforcing the idea that homosexuality was something from abroad. So the French, the Germans, they are queers, they are outside. The Spanish nation is actually a macho nation. So uh, we have not to think and take these stories of people coming from other countries as an example of liberation or not, of course not. It's quite the opposite. It was um, uh, actually a 
quite clever strategy uh, to reinforce the idea of Spain as something unique, Spain as something that is the Christian uh, vanguard and uh, is something to keep actually um, the idea of uh, Spain is different, that, man, uh, that we know that Manuel Fraga used uh, really cleverly to become and to change the idea of a dictatorial regime in the face of the European uh, Western countries. So this is just two examples, and with the example with the pictures from Plaza Mayor, it's just three different examples of how we, how we uh, can approach these stories. Uh, if you see, I never mentioned the sexual liberation movements in Spain. I never mentioned the legal framework. I just mentioned different aspects of people living their lives, struggling, fighting, and of course, having lives. Because queer people was not just hiding at home. They were having lives. They were having sex. They were having families. They were having friends. And it's something that we also have to recover. And when we think about public space, and when we think about memory and how we recover memory, I think we should pay also attention to these aspects because, the, of course, the sexual liberation movement is a major issue in our history. But if we forget the history of the daily life of the quotidian, we are also uh, giving uh, the historical narratives what they want that they will obliterate us from history and that we are not actually part of the common uh, history of the social life of every city. And with that, I finish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's move to the memories of the sexual liberation movement. And um, today um, I will present the results, the memory of an event we uh, organized in the last April uh, as a working group. We are three members of a working group. Um, uh, that Okay. Um, uh, uh, the working group is working on um, queer and feminist studies, and uh, we, as PhD researcher, uh, researchers uh, working on queer different queer and uh, histories, uh, we organized this event, um, which was entitled uh, "Making LGBT Plus Memories and Histories," and the idea for this event. Uh, came uh, from the fact that uh, this year, 2022, um, was the first uh, year in which uh, uh, the um, Italian LGBT History Month uh, was established, and uh, April was uh, April. April was the the, uh, the choice. April was the result of a choice uh, of the organization of the LGBT History Month. Why April? April uh, is the, uh, the month uh, in which, uh, uh, in 1972, do you hear me? Okay. Um, in 1972, uh, one of the first uh, Italian um, homosexual movement organized a, a protest against a congress of sexologists in Sanremo, um, which is a, a, a very small city um, in the north of Italy. Uh, the idea was to um, question this choice, to, to uh, try to, to look uh, at the actors, at the, uh, at the, the ways in which this choice uh, was the result of, a, of the production of a collective memory um, on this event in 1972. Uh, beside this, um, we noticed a, 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 a big public interest in, in uh, LGBT and queer memories in Italy, and um, so we tried to organize a, a public discussion in Florence, together with the Scuola Normale uh, Superiore, um, in which we, we, we gather different actors involved in the production of collective memories and uh, histories uh, to discuss uh, the choice of this um, month as LGBT plus history month in, in Italy, and to see how the different experiences of uh, queer memories and histories can dialogue and uh, also uh, producing tensions uh, between them. So uh, our understanding of um, memories is some, and histories as well is uh, something um, which is 
the result of uh, different actors who uh, can dialogue uh, in different times and places and who, in, in, through their discussions, they produced, defined different times and performed as well different understandings of memories. So we gather in this event, in this public discussion, open to the public in Florence, um, Four, <laughs> four main actors, we can say. Uh, there are other actors, of, of course, but we, we gathered four, four types of actors. Uh, us, as history and uh, sociology researchers, um, as two, uh, two different, uh, with different perspectives on, on queer history. Then there, was, um, uh, there were two local um, LGBT plus associations um, active in Florence, uh, which have uh, um, local archives. So they, they are also engaged in, in producing a sort of a space uh, of memory, space of sources. Then uh, there were three activists uh, from the 70s, but they, they, uh, they, they are active uh, um, now with a different type of activism uh, focused on the, the commemoration, focused on the production of exhibitions, museums, uh, archives uh, on the history of the Ita Italy in the 70s, queer Italy in the 70s. Then there was the audience, um, which was composed mainly by uh, activists and people interested in, um, in queer history. I would like to focus on, um, on, the, uh, three, uh, on the three activists uh, involved because I think uh, it is a crucial element to, to take into, into account. Um, you, you can see uh, the three names. Uh, the three activists um, were uh, characterized by different backgrounds in terms of uh, gender, um, biography, uh, provenance, and this is a crucial element to understand how uh, th their views on their activism uh, was, were um, uh, defined and performed according to their subjectivity and to their experiences in uh, activism. Uh, because a crucial element to, to take into account is that um, compared to the other two presentations is, we, uh, is that we are talking now about the history of activism, the, the, the history of uh, LGBT politics, uh, mainly in the 70s. Angelo Pezzana was the first one, was one of the, fo the founders of uh, the, one of the first um, homosexual movement in Italy, uh, which was called Fuori, uh, and was active between 1971 and 1981. And um, he was the leader uh, of, of, the, uh, of the group active in Torino, in the north of Italy. And um, he was the leader uh, throughout all uh, the, 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 the entire history of the movement. Then, uh, since the 80s, um, he, he was engaged in, in, uh, in, uh, in collecting uh, and uh, producing, uh, creating a, 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 an archive of the, the activity of the movement uh, in order to, um, to promote also a, a cultural history of homosexuality in Italy. Uh, he founded a, a, um, a foundation uh, which is called Fondazione Sandro Penna Fuori um, we, um, with the aim of uh, having an archive, but also to promote um, the civil rights uh, history of, of uh, the, the movement. Mm. He was also, um, he, he is uh, the, the, the author of two autobiographies in which he, um, he linked uh, um, his experience to uh, the history of the, of the movement. Porpora Marcasciano um, was the second, the second activist. Um, he, she was active in different movement and small groups in Italy um, since the, 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 the second half of the 70s, we can say. And um, she, she also um, uh, became engaged in the Movimento Identità Trans, uh, uh, which in the 80s was called Movimento um, 
Italiano transessuali, um, which is a big difference <laughs> between the two, the two definitions. And uh, now she is part of the city council of the, the city of Bologna in Italy. And uh, um, she also author of, of different books in which um, she, she um, links uh, her autobiography uh, to uh, the trans experience as a sort of uh, fil rouge, as a sort of a way to understand and to observe uh, the uh, queer history in Italy. The last speaker was um, Nerina Milletti. Uh, she's a um, a feminist and lesbian activist, and since the, the end of the 70s uh, in Florence, I, 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 I forgot, uh, Porpora Marcasciano was mainly active in Bologna, and Nerina Milletti in Florence and Angelo Pezzana in Torino. Um, Nerina Milletti uh, was part of the lesbians groups, uh, separatist lesbian groups in, in, uh, in Florence uh, since the end of the, of the 70s. But then uh, uh, she, uh, she became a, a, an historian, so she's very engaged in producing um, the um, books, uh, um, articles on LGBT and specifically lesbian history um, in, in Italy. Uh, we can uh, see that all, three, all the three are uh, interested in promoting um, researching uh, or um, uh, discovering uh, queer history in Italy, and this is the reason why uh, we, we choose these names in, in, our, in our panel. Um, I would like to, uh, to, to present now their relationship with, with history. Uh, as I mentioned before, in, um, the, the event was organized by two kinds of researcher, uh, historians and sociologists, um, so we, we, we try to, to uh, frame our questions in, in, uh, um, in a way that we, we linked uh, past and present, uh, in, in starting from an understanding of memories as a sort of um, way to, to understand how past and present, uh, present are not um, uh, linearly connected, but um, are connected in a sort of network and um, back and forward um, way. Um, I, I already mentioned, the, this is a photo from Sanremo, from the protest at the center of our um, um, event, but um, through uh, the, the question about Sanremo to, uh, to the three activists, we, we were able to understand their different relationship with, the, uh, with history. Um, we we, we uh, simply asked to, um, what, uh, what were, uh, what was their relationship with, uh, with history and the history of Sanremo, and they framed their, their answers in a, in a way um, mm, linked to their experience, experiences in, uh, um, in political activism, not only in the 70s, but uh, in, the, in the following decades. Angelo Pezzana framed is, is the only one uh, who, who, who was present in, in Sanremo, who was active in Sanremo, who was uh, in, directly engaged in the, in the protest, and, uh, he framed, but he framed his, uh, um, his answer in a way um, that we can understand how the, 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 um, his following activism, the, the, um, the protest in Saremo was framed, the, the, the aim was a revolutionary aim. So uh, the Fuori at the beginning in, from the 1971 to 1974 was a revolutionary uh, movement. But in the, in, the, in the answer of Angelo Pezzana, the revolutionary um, history of the movement was uh, high. Um, was something uh, not mentioned uh, because the movement after 1974 uh, merged in, in the Partito Radicale, who was a, a civil rights um, uh, party, and, and so this protest was um, the, the history of this protest was framed according to the uh, to the history of, uh, of, uh, of to the to the uh, following history of the Fuori. So the, the reformist and civil rights model, um, which the Fuori had. And, uh, since the 1974, we can say. On the opposite, we can, we can say how Nerina Milletti, who, is, uh, um, who, were, who was part of, of um, lesbian separatist uh, uh, movement, uh, framed his, his uh, interest in history, in queer history, as a sort of 
um, direct engagement in doing justice with history, in looking for um, lesbian experiences within the Fuori, who, who was, uh, which was a movement uh, in which lesbians were, were active, but uh, they, they, were, uh, they were marginalized in some ways. And we, we can say through the, 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 um, the words of Nerina Milletti that uh, the, um, his doing his uh, practice of history and his um, telling of memories um, are framed according to, to this aim of doing history to, to, uh, um, to make visible lesbian, to make visible marginalized experiences. The linear uh, account of Angelo Pezzana, who was a leader, um, was challenged also by Porpora Marcasciano, um, uh, who in, in her uh, history of activism, in her experiences, uh, passed through different experiences of uh, cultural, political, and um, political activism. And so we, we can... We can um, we can so through we can see uh, we could see through uh, in her words how the the uh, this um, passage through different micro communities to different places in Italy uh, she she uh, comes from the south of Italy and then uh, when when she was uh, uh, I think 30 um, she moved in the north and pa passing through different different type of activism and these experiences um, framed also. Um, her way of telling memories. Mm, so they, they, uh, she, she uh, um, urged a, a model of history not based on a linear and um, objective um, uh, framework, but in a, 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 a type of history made of different narratives. Um, to, to, to make an example, Pe uh, Angelo Pezzana uh, claimed that uh, history is made of facts. And so uh, she, uh, he claimed that mm, the, the, the history of the protest in Sanremo, uh, which was at the center of our, our um, uh, question, uh, was made only by, uh, by few people and not... Uh, and, Mm, there are lots of narratives on, the, on, that, uh, on that protest that are not, not true, that are false. But uh, in uh, opposite to, to this type of narrative based on, on, on fact, on, on an objective understanding of history, there are the other two. Nerina Milletti, who, who mm, had a, a sort of engagement in, in producing history, and Porpora Marcasciano, who uh, told that, uh, who said that uh, history is made of different narratives uh, in an ongoing debate, in an ongoing um, understanding. Um, I, oh, sorry, okay. Um, I, I, I will try to, to be um, <laughs> short. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing is that uh, we can, um, through the, the dialogue with the audience, uh, we were able to, uh, to see uh, the way in which the, the, um, the, the, the activism in, in our, like activists who, who are active in, in Florence now, uh, framed their understanding of, of the of the history of the queer history, they um, asked lots of questions to uh, to the, the activism, uh, asking uh, the um, uh, with terms like non-binary, like uh, uh, terms who are linked, which are linked to to our 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 days, and the uh, um, all the three activists um, performed a sort of uh, um, of distance between them and. Uh, the new generation. This is the reason why I, I quote generations, because they um, uh, framed their narratives in a sort of distance, in, with a sense of distance between them and, uh, and the protests that are not able, they, they are not able to understand now. So this is a, a crucial element to understand. And um, another way is, another example is linked to the notion of community. Uh, lots of people asked um, um, how they uh, conceived uh, the, the notion of community. And um, through the, 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 the answers of the three activists, we were able to understand that the notion of community is not, uh, is not um, the, 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 the 
the same in which now is produced uh, as sort of LGBT communities. They, Angelo Pezzano refers to community as a movement. Uh, Nerina Milletti refers to, um, to community as a, as a sort of micro um, existential uh, place where people are friends and, and a very small, small uh, understanding of community. And Porvor Marcasciano referred to community as a, as a, as a um, place of practices, place of uh, struggles with services, especially linked to the trans experiences. Um, this is only a, 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 a small <laughs> explanation of, of uh, how uh, I understand, um, uh, understand um, I, I'm able to, to frame this, this kind of uh, dialogue between histories, memories, and subjectivities. Uh, and I, I think that a queer approach could be the only way to, to challenge a linear, um, a linear way to, to frame spaces, a normative way to frame temporalities. Um, through the dialogue between uh, uh, activists, ancient activists, activists, researchers, um, we were able to, to see how the different chronologies uh, are framed by, by different actors, but also how memory is performed as in perceived as a, as a site of struggle, as a site to, to strengthen um, political and political aim of the of the of uh, of. Um, of uh, uh, movements that are now now engaged in in LGBT uh, history and also tensions around vocabularies. Vocabularies are used, performed, conceived in different ways according to subjectivities, and um, collective memories are able to to, uh, to to change their meanings. And then um, I, I already mentioned the political aims are framed always through history. Spatialities, and in the same way, uh, to, to be to be uh, short, uh, I would say that Italy. We cannot frame a, um, Italian queer history, but we can frame a plural uh, um, Italian queer history uh, from the big cities to the local one, as Moises said for Spain. Um, but. Uh, through the three experiences uh, we, we heard in, in our public discussion, we, we were able to, to um, uh, understand how the, the Italy is not something perceived as, an, as a, uh, as a frame, framework, in, as, a, as a space of action, but uh, spaces, micro spaces, uh, um, networks, uh, international networks were the places of activism. And then the, the, last, uh, the last slide is linked to the fact that um, in producing histories, in producing, in producing memories, we, we, we must be uh, aware that uh, the, the, uh, the voices who, who, who we are able to, 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 to hear are influenced by uh, intersectionality and power. And then all these elements uh, dialogue in, in a sort of ongoing, ongoing discussion in, in which uh, um, uh, uh, leaders, uh, uh, people who participated in movements, uh, researchers, uh, activists um, are always engaged and are always um, in, a, in a steady dialogue. And it's a sort of um, power is something linked not only to, um, to one of, of the actors uh, involved, but to, uh, is spread between, between different, different um, actors. And intersectionality is something to, 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 to take into, into account to understand um, why uh, queer history, LGBT history, lesbian history, transgender history, gay history uh, are time and again defined uh, in, in different ways, in, in, uh, in many times uh, opposite ways, but uh, this is something that we, we have to be, to, be, um, to be aware. And the public discussion I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about is an example of that. And, uh, for thank you, uh, I would like to, to, to quote only an example made by uh, Porpora Marcasciano, one of the activists. Uh, she um, told us that um, when Silvia Rivera, one of the most famous um, activists in Stonewall, uh, came to, to Italy, uh, she, she told to, to, to her that she was not the first one to, to flying a battle against police, but the second one to, 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 uh, to show how history and icon some uh, chronologies and uh, uh, um, I don't know narratives are time and again something that are uh, um, 
something that depended depends on on the 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 the, the source of the voice, not on not on the on, on the <laughs> narratives uh, that are, are produced, but not only uh, are, are only an objective history, but something that is always always uh, um, to be discussed, to be to be performed in different ways. Thank you. Thank you very much to the three of them. We have some five minutes for questions. And thank you, because these have been three examples that, in my mind, give us quite a good overview on things that could be translated elsewhere in Europe, but also elsewhere in the world. Because with these micro stories, they have given us quite a pluralistic view. So thank you. Thank you for relating the past and the present. Thank you for linking history and memories, memories through historical research, archives, literature, that now we can go over through. So I'll give the floor to the audience for some questions before we break. Of Ricardo's presentation, uh, where he, between the actors, you made a difference between the researchers, the historical and sociological researchers, and the activists. Like, where do you draw the line? Uh, do you consider yourself to be an activist? Do you consider yourself to be activist? Where do you draw the line between the researchers and the activists in that sense? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think it's a crucial one uh, because uh, I, I, I frame the, 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 um, my, 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 uh, my scheme of the, of the discussion in this way, but I think that mm, there are mm, subjectivity, there are people who, who are uh, intersected by different engagements. So uh, academic research can be uh, activism and activism can be uh, academic research. Uh, and I think the, the crucial element to, 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 uh, to observe is the fact that only uh, through dialogue, through uh, the dialogue between different actors, so um, opening academy, academia and uh, on the one side and uh, being uh, um, open to, to other views on, on history from the, the activism um, side could be a, a crucial way to understand how memories, histories can be framed and reframed time and again. It's, but there is no a, a, a definitive and uh, uh, objective way to, to, to frame the division between activism and researcher. Hola. Good afternoon. I, I would like to talk about the three presentations in that related precisely on the intersectionality. I would like to bear in mind Harvey Milk, that precisely after Castro, after the ghetto, he said, we need to involve with the society. We need to engage with the society. Otherwise, we will always be isolated. And so here, the Catalan association movement is against the ghetto and against being considered a community, unlike some other places in Spain where they rather live in their own areas and happiness. So um, maybe in your presentations, I missed uh, also mostly in the one from Poland, is, in, um, for instance, I'm the, the HIV, and I felt like in the TV show, it's a scene how the, the HIV was something that was really important. You know, asking for equal marriage was not something that was found there back in the 68 or in Stonewall. There was no claim for marriage between same-sex partners. And that, that was something as a, was brought as the people who were dying and the, the ones that were left had no rights on the, the partners dying. And that was quite an impact on us and the gay people. And then on the trans community, in 2007, along with the Triangle Foundation, we organized the conference. And 2007, trans were asking for 
the hormone healthcare treatment, also in surgery treatments. They're, they were not on non-binary things. So there's been uh, an evolution on that regard here. And, uh, and also on the history of Spain, uh, I need to refer to Armando Fluvia. He was the one that he being in a specific social status and he having this possibility for resilience with the homosexual Spanish movement against what was passed in the Spanish law. So this shows that there is an interconnection between European countries because it was back then André Brody and Marc Adi in France and then Foire in, Foire in Italy. I, these were the three interconnected uh, links and that was uh, stemming mostly from the gay community. And lesbians, I, I think it would be interesting to look at the Spanish Mengele, so the Vallejo Rajera, and his research on the so-called red and lesbian women because it was difficult for him to understand them. So just wanted to point at that. And here in Barcelona, by the way, in 1930s, Shai Jeanette, he enriched himself with the Criolla and the rascals and the crooks on the Barricino district here in Barcelona. Thank you. Hi, um, uh, I liked all of your lectures a lot. Um, I found them all very interesting, though. I have a bit of an observation about the one uh, on Poland. I really liked it. I'm so glad that the LGBT community in Poland is active and more combative than ever. But uh, I think you were referring to the, the trans person who, who killed themselves with she, her pronouns when uh, I think I looked it up, they mainly use they, them. So just that, careful with the misgendering. Yes, thank you. There is also the problem of translation. In Polish, you, don't, you would not use them or they because you just don't. However, Polish has different pronouns because there is also neutrum, as in German. But neutrum is something that you can use to animal as well. So there is this problem or a challenge in language and also in translating. But thank you for bringing it. Also, the thing is that the person used, used, um, chose for themselves the name Milo, I think, right? Which is um, similarly to actually Spanish and Italian. You can recognize very often after the name the gender. Those ending with A are usually female names. And with a consonant like my name, Camille, are, uh, are male names. With O, that would be a name for a, for a child or for an animal or for something that is not living. And some people offer, but why am I explaining it? Um, is that there, is, there are possibilities in language that are still being explored. And it is challenging when we talk about them. And of course, maybe in English I should refer to the person them. Thank you. Just, um, I think I'll, I'll respond to your comment. No, because I, I was with Armand uh, in December and we have a long discussion. It's just, of course, we, I, maybe I didn't uh, manage to, to claim this. Of course, this is really important. It's just that my presentation wanted to focus outside the sexual liberation movements because, of course, it's part of the narrative, but is that we have to uh, enlarge this narrative because otherwise we will lose people. Because one problem when we focus only on sexual liberation movements is this issue about language. The, mo the movement at the beginning was a gay liberation movement. That in, that mo in that moment in history, we have to understand that actually gay includes things that are not related to gay right now. Gay right now refers to male to male, sexual desire, etc. while uh, in that moment in history, gay could refer actually to the to the, in the sense of queer communities that we understand now from the English perspective. So I think that the approach to the local, not just focusing on the movements that, of course, in my work, I introduce all these names, and of course, they deserve more than, uh, than ever to be recognized, but also 
and this is maybe a personal point of view, we also have to pay attention to those people who were not able to participate uh, in the 70s because they were not anymore there, but they were queer too, and they deserve to be recognized, historicized, and we have to give them the space in history that they deserve. Because, for example, one of the persons I, I have um, in my research, he died uh, uh, in 65, so he never knew the sexual liberation movements. But he was a gay man, he was prosecuted more than 20 times in Madrid, and I think telling his history is also making uh, una enmienda in history, <laughs> I don't know how to say in English, sorry, <laughs> is, is that uh, they deserve to be acknowledged too. And it doesn't go against the history of uh, sexual liberation movements, it's just they complement and enlarge the view of uh, histories. That's my comment. Only about um, about ter terminology, the words we use. Uh, in my presentation, I use homosexual movement because um, the Fori um, did not use gay. They explained the first issues of their magazine uh, what what did mean gay? <laughs> because they, they did not uh, did know uh, uh, gay is a word. They did not use that, and so it's interesting to to, to use it. And about networks, uh, I think that we have to frame net um, spaces and categories of spaces not according to the uh, normative categories of local, national, international, transnational, but according to the connection we, um, uh, which people was uh, were engaged in. So it's it's. I, I'm, I totally agree with you. Bé, doncs moltes gràcies. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Let's be back at half past three to watch the film, okay? Um, we will have Thomas Ryder. The film is Great Freedom, and Thomas Ryder is the scriptwriter of the film, and he will respond to your questions after the screening. And the next session will be the second panel from the local to the global perspective, lesbians in Catalonia this evening. And hopefully you will all be there too. Enjoy your lunch and the film.